Well, good morning. I guess it's afternoon now. Uh, thanks so much uh, for being here. Uh, because of uh, our COVID concerns, uh, we're having uh, the talk outside, obviously, and the exhibit is on the second floor in the Surf Gallery, and it will be running until the end of December, but uh, if you haven't seen it so far this morning, uh, please uh, uh, take your time and, and go upstairs. So we're so excited to have Jill Madden and Caleb Kenna here for the Sightlines exhibit. Um, originally, I knew Jill, but uh, for this exhibit, she was introduced uh, to the museum by our trustee, Sylvia Gonzalez, who's in the back, and uh, she just waved her hand. And, uh, and then I talked to Jill, and she told me about her painting in uh, the Bread Loaf Wilderness Area and the Patel Wilderness Area. And then she recommended uh, Caleb, because they would run across each other as uh, almost weekly, if not bi-weekly, or frequently in the mountains of the Green Mountains. So we wanted to do the civic exhibit first and foremost to recognize them as accomplished artists and uh, also to recognize that we all are privileged to enjoy uh, the Green Mountains. And part of it is recognizing also Joseph Patel, who was responsible uh, for purchasing the Green Mountains and uh, originally donating them to Middlebury College and eventually they became part of the forest. And he also, for a dollar, sold to the state a camel's hump in the area around camel's hump. So part of the exhibit will be to remind us all of the legacy of Joseph Patel. And just in Middlebury, he was responsible for the Patel block. He was responsible for the Morgan horse farm and what we use every day. He was responsible for building and financing uh, the stone uh, bridge, which is in the center of town. So as a history museum and as an art museum, we want to uh, equally emphasize the importance of our history and the importance of uh, contemporary art and art uh, from the ages uh, uh, to our community. Because we are a community, a museum that wants to tell stories about uh, Middlebury, Addison County, and Vermont. Uh, so thank you uh, for being here. Uh, we're gonna hand it over. Um, I don't think I need to go through their bios right now, but uh, Jill uh, is a Middlebury College graduate, and uh, Caleb grew up here in Brandon. Jill settled here after going to, to college, and they both had a lot of experience in art exhibits and, in and Caleb in photography and Jill in painting, and they're both outdoors people. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn it over to them. And just to remind you, I can do it at the end, but uh, this exhibit also uh, is going to have a series of speakers. And because of COVID, they're by, they're by Zoom. They're by Bill McKibben. And also David. Bill will talk about the environment and the importance of the mountains to people like Jill and Caleb. And David Bain, an English professor retired at the college, will talk about Joseph Patel. And Will Amadon, who is a geography professor at the college, and he will be uh, sharing some new techniques with us. So all that is available with the dates. Um, and added to this exhibit is a I gotta get the names right here. It's a last minute submission by a group of recently retired, a recently graduated military graduates. Uh, they're called Tree Line Terrains Topography You Can Touch. So we have two of their wooden carvings in the exhibit uh, of areas that are featured in the paintings and in the photographs. So without further ado, I just want to also mention my colleague, Mary Manley, who's uh, is responsible in large part for the exhibit, and also uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor Rossini, who is not, I don't see her here, but she's uh, an essential part of the exhibit. 
Uh, so thank you all for coming, and I'll turn it over to our artists. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Mary, and everyone at the Henry Sheldon Museum. It's been great working with you. Um, Caleb and I talked about just having sort of a conversation here today, and um, I have some questions for him, and I think he has some questions for me. So we will just start. Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear this? Yeah. Have to use the microphone. Is it better? Better. Yeah, it's essential. Okay, essential. So my first question for Caleb, because I often run into him early in the morning, pre-dawn, um, not often, but several times, is how, I know how I prepare for pre-dawn excursions, but I'm wondering how a photographer prepares for an early morning, let's say you know you're going to go to some destination, what do you have to do to get ready? Thanks, Jill. Does this work? I'm not used to using these. Well, the first thing I do is I look at the weather report. That's, that's my favorite thing. And then the second thing is I love maps. So I'm always looking at maps. And one of the reasons Jill and I are always running into each other is we live in Weybridge. I live in Middlebury. And uh, the uh, Sheep Farm Road, Hamilton Trail around Middlebury parking lot is right between those. So, and it's a very beautiful spot. That's um, where I took the picture of camels up, up, up there. And um, I love all the farm fields out there and all the light is incredible. So yes, more than once we've run into each other <laughs> and Evan with the dogs. And, and so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, when I see that the weather's going to be good um, for that type of photography. I get out early and of course in the summer it's five, six in the morning, uh, but now it's seven, it's getting later, so you kind of adjust um, you know, through the seasons. Um, so I think I've, I've been doing photos related to the Mattel legacy longer than I realized because his legacy is all around. Whether it's Middlebury, the Morgan Horse Farm, um, Green Mountains, uh, National Forest, Camel's Hub. It's, I was amazed to learn all those things. So um, it's, it's sort of, it was a natural fit, I think, to, to do this. So my question is, is that a jetpack? Or do you do something related to painting? And how do you, how do you hike far back into the wilderness and paint? Isn't the camera easier? <laughs> Let's see what's um, in there. So, this, I sort of brought my full pack. I have different packs. I have a pack addiction. <laughs> um, this is heavy here. Here, yeah, you can feel it. Oh, it's really heavy. Do you want um, but I can go lightweight. And. Yeah. One, one thing I added to my pack that I don't always bring with me is some bear spray. <laughs> Not necessarily for bears, um, but I do bring that maybe for bear dogs. Um, I have probably the, the heaviest thing in my pack is my easel. Lightweight as far as the easel goes. Just a tripod. Is this what Van Gogh used? Exactly. <laughs> I bought it from Van. Um, so this is like a little easel box. I've experimented with a lot of easels over the years. So I've been painting maybe 30 years. Um, this little easel is called a strata. And it has a palette, and I use little panels on it for smaller paintings. Um, I have larger easels that I will bring if I'm doing a commission or if I'm um, 
know that I'll be close to a roadside. But I can hike in with just this box and no tripod, and it's very lightweight. Um, I can also, I often go up Camel's Hump or up on a peak and um, with some people that are sitting here. I haven't done this. And um, I will bring a small, a small moleskin that's a water, it's a watercolor book, small sketchbook. Um, do some little, so I'll just pass this around, but I, um, I might just bring this little kit, which kind of has, has everything for a watercolor sketch. Um, I, I use gouache, I don't use watercolor, gouache is a opaque water-based paint. I have different uh, brushes. Not an easy question, this is very complicated. <laughs> a lot of gear. Um, these are really nice brushes. And so everything sort of folds up, compact, depending on how how lightweight you want to go. Um, what else is in my pack? I have a first aid kit. I, I am uh, certified for wilderness first aid. Um, Amy would never let me go out without being certified. <laughs> I have some other tools that are not um, brushes that I use. I use a bowl scraper, and I use this to put a, it's a cooking tool, scrape your dough out of your bowl, or you could put what's called a couch on a panel or a canvas. So you put a layer of medium down first, it makes it more um, viscous, more, val more malleable. And then, I do have a whole bunch of brushes. I usually carry a lot of brushes with me because I don't like to muddy my paintings. So, uh, Does the cold affect your painting ability? Yeah. How so? It does. <laughs> well, we, we, met, we ran into each other at Mount Horrid at Brandon Gap and one, one day in March, and it was very, very cold and very, very sunny. And we hiked up in the snow. And, and what were you wearing, Caleb? Not the proper gear. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get very far. Jill got a lot farther. You got there. You got there. Jeans. Okay. I said, wait, are you from Vermont? <laughs> it looks very sunny. I didn't know it was that deep. Um, this is sort of a, a, like a smaller bowl scraper to make different kinds of marks. I like mark making. Um, if it is very cold, I will put in my brushes for my little watercolor kit, I will put vodka. Wow. It's very handy. It's very <laughs> secret. Um, it doesn't freeze, and it will still make the pigment uh, viscous, whatever. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, <laughs> paint. Sample that. Um, these little tiny palettes. I used this this morning up on Snake Mountain with my artist assistant, Evan. He's been promoted to artist assistant, some husband. Um, and for, for oil paint, so oil takes maybe 20 minutes to freeze in very cold weather. Um, you can extend that with different mediums different oils and I also will take, if I know I'm going up, let's say Camel Sump, it's an hour, it's maybe 45 minute hike, fast hike, I'll go super lightweight and maybe lay out my palette ahead of time, maybe even mix some colors. If it's winter and I sort of know what palette it's gonna be, you know, what, what blues are. Um, and I also have tried heating underneath the palette, having some, some sort of heating or keep it well insulated and it'll give me another 20 minutes so I hope to get at least an hour for a sketch up there um, and a lot of my pack then is taken up with down coats <laughs> several down coats <laughs> so that's that that's what's in my pack um, 
Um, I have another question for Caleb about the evolution of your photography with the drone. How has that affected your subject matter or your editing process? Thanks. So I, I started in newspapers as a newspaper photographer. So I've been a photographer for 25 years. And so I love to study light and um, composition and things like that. So when drones came along, it was a natural evolution. Um, before drones, I would hire an airplane once or twice a year and hope for good weather. Mm -hmm. But now you can set up a drone in a few minutes and um, start start doing photos. So it just adds a whole another perspective to to my pictures that is hard to achieve, you know, on a ladder or from a mountaintop. I was always looking for different vantage points, um, but now uh, you can see the patterns in the land from the farmers, from the rivers, um, from railroad tracks, whatever it is. So. Um, this is the drone that I use. It's very um, compact. Oh, wow. This is the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. It is a quad. What does that mean? Quad arms. Quad mm -hmm. copter, I guess. Here's the, it's a Hasselblad <laughs> lens that's built into it. It has a, um, put a memory card in, or it has internal memory, so if you forget your card, you're saved battery and these last about 20 minutes per flight 25 and um, you don't need you don't need much of the space to take off this, is, this would be a perfect uh, launch pad no no I'm not going to play we could that was great so this is how it works plug in uh, an iPhone or an iPad and turn on the drone and you can see what what you're photographing using the phone and then you're controlling it with the little joysticks so it's incredibly easy to use I, I never played video games or anything mm -hmm. I'm not skilled that way so just by watching some YouTube videos and practicing Lot, every day if possible. Um, I, I've just gone out and done pictures, whether it's a sunny day, there's great shadows, or cloudy days are great for that really saturated color straight down. So I've uh, just loved using a drone and still love using it. I use it as much as I can. I still do regular photos. And you, you know, you need to know which, um, which lens or which camera is going to be good for a certain thing. Um, so, like Bailey Falls, which was a great uh, recommendation from Jill, I tried the drone, and it's in the forest by, by uh, the snow bowl, and, um, but in the end, it was a camera on a tripod that was, was better. So, it, it really just depends what you're trying to do. Do you edit it on your computer at home, then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I shoot maybe 20, 30, 40 pictures during a session, maybe more, and then bring it home, put it in the computer, go through, edit, make choices, and then um, oftentimes use Instagram to, to share pictures. How did you become a painter? Or why did you become a painter? <laughs> um, how and why? And when? And when? I... I did take art classes in college, but I wasn't becoming a painter. I studied Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, um, and I went to China right after college, and I met Eben, China. <laughs> but I did start painting in China. I, took, I studied Chinese painting, and um, it was just an ink painting with ink brushes. And when I came back, I started studying oil painting. That's the evolution. Why? Who your favorite I painters? always. Who are my favorite painters? Um, so, I have a lot of favorite painters. I think one of my sort of mentors is Lois Dodd. She's 94. She 
is a plein air painter like myself. Uh, she lives in Maine and New York City, and she has a big exhibit up right now at the Alexander Gallery in New York. And then there's a whole slew of younger painters. Um, Claire Sherman, who paints the wood. She does not paint plein air. She paints them from photographs that she takes. Uh, Emma Webster, Eleanor Ray, who lives in Vermont, in southern Vermont, part time. They're all great uh, landscape painters. Woody Jackson. <laughs> another amazing painter sitting in the front row right here. Uh, Woody and I painted outside together once in Wyoming. It's very fun. I like painting with people outside sometimes. You like cows, though? I love cows. <laughs> I love cows. Yeah. No brain question. Uh, I don't really have a great answer for that question. I guess why or how I came, became a painter. I just, I think I am a painter. Just evolved into it. Um, I had another question. Oh, so what what things or other art forms are you looking at, Caleb, that inform your photography? Well, um, I of course look at the New York Times and National Geographic are you know things that I look at all the time. I love photography books. Um, I love learning about other photographers, whether they be. Yeah, the Ansel Adams or the or um, the famous photographers or up and coming photographers. Um, I look at Netflix films. Drones are used all the time in, in that uh, medium. So I love films. Um, I uh, of course look at Instagram because you can see so many photographers there from all around the world, and that's one of the great um, ways you can connect with people across the world um, because. People make comments. You, you, you like work. They like work. Um, so yeah, it's a constant um, inspiration. Um, but um, and uh, let's see, other sources. <laughs> oh yes, poetry, <laughs> literature, yeah, things like that. So yeah, it's a constant um, source of you know looking the light, the natural light, uh, just being inspired by it. So. I guess the, um, I I studied at the main photo workshops and with different photographers like Jim Blair, who was a, a good friend. Um, um, uh, Eugene Richards is a, a famous black and white photographer, documentary photographer, and those were great experiences where you go and study with photographers for a week and shoot constantly with other students and you get feedback um, and then of course I shoot a lot for publications so I'm always looking for feedback from editors and I'd love to see how pictures look when they're published or on the wall so sort of evolution what's your favorite part of the Mattel wilderness uh, or the yeah I didn't tell you that one or the all the area that we've we've done I like to go. I like to go to different parts that I haven't been to before. Um, one of my favorite hikes, I'd say, that I did last spring, and it was pretty snowy, was Mount Roosevelt. Looking to Roosevelt with Amy and Evan here. So I had you here to drive around the other side of the Green Mountains and start there. Um, and that was fun, just because it was a trail I hadn't been on before. I like to. Um, this this show is interesting because it has made me really look at all the topo maps and try every trail that I can find. And I have gotten to certain trails where um, I actually can't find the trail. So I did try to go up um, Bingo Brook Road, which is over in Rochester. And there is a trail marked over there at the base of this road, but I actually couldn't really find the trail. So I might wait for November for that when the leaves clear and maybe it's a little more obvious. Um, and I like bushwhacking. I like getting advice from people who tell me how you can get somewhere. Get Have I gotten lost? No, I have a huge fear of getting lost. <laughs> I'm very afraid of getting lost. 
So I do have different apps on my phone, Gaia and uh, Trail Forks, and tell me where I am at all times. <laughs> what about you? What's your favorite part of the wilderness? Um, I, I need to explore the wilderness much more. I have not been, I feel like if we just scratched the surface in this, it's such a huge area with the long trail going, going uh, through um, and the other side of the mountains. But um, yeah, I mean, Lake Pliad was a, a favorite from this. Bailey's Falls, Bailey Falls was really great. Um, but again, I, I, I think I need to get out and hike some more because I'm used to normally driving places and then getting the drone out and doing pictures, but with this you really need to get away from the car <laughs> and, uh, and hike or bike. So that was that was that was fun exploring, but it's just scratching the surface. So but I think we would be welcome welcome your questions because that might spark a few uh, other ideas if you have any questions. Um, it's, I feel like it's a moronic question, but you, you, like said, that, you said that the, the battery lasts 20 minutes, so presumably you've got to remember to to leave enough time in the battery to get it. No, that's the great thing about technology is it tells you when there's 25% left, oh, okay. so it starts making a very loud beeping sound, and then at that point you know you have 25% left. So, and it'll tell you if there's only enough energy to um, return to home where you launched it from. So it's it's pretty amazing. So it's it's, it's not going to just plummet somewhere into. <laughs> no, unless you're canoeing on Otter Creek in Ferrisburg and you put it down on a launch pad and it falls into the water by itself. <laughs> That's never happened. That's never happened. <laughs> but fortunately, there's good. Good, that was another drone. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a good replacement program with DJI. So, <laughs> so it's almost idiot proof. <laughs> so, so, if you take your, you remix you your paints, you know, yeah. and then you bring them out, yeah. <laughs> and, and you put those uh, heat, uh, you know, things in the pockets, is that how you keep it warm? Because Otherwise, even in your backpack, unless you have it positioned behind your back, it would also be cold as you pipe. So I, I well, you can wrap it in a down coat. You want to keep the hand warmers, if you take them out of your hands, are going to just freeze up, right, get solid. So you have to keep them in your hands and then put them under the... What I've done is put them under the pallet here. You can lift this up um, and then have more hand warmers at the ready in your hands. That'll only extend it like five minutes each each time, but sometimes a little bit longer. If it's not, you know, negative 20, it's fine. Um, standing at negative 20 is probably right. also the, the, the equal to the amount of time your face has to, to get cold. To coagulate. Well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and eventually it will just get hard. It'll, right? It'll Thank you. It's amazing. Both of you have very short periods of time that you get to Operate. This is another cold related question. So if the batteries get too cold on the drone, the, the drone can um, land and un, unintentionally. So one, mm -hmm. one time I, the drone landed in the middle of a snow field and I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. So I had to use the find my drone function of the GPS <laughs> to wander around in the field, in the snow field. And thankfully it was just sitting um, peacefully on the snow as opposed to a fence or a tree or something like that. So. You do have to be careful in the cold, so keep it. It landed smoothly, <laughs> but it could have hit something, a tree, for instance, and become the third or fourth drone. <laughs> but it did. I have a question for both of you. Uh, so, Caleb, have you had a chance to visit the since we're sitting here, the research center? and take a look at the fabulous collection of historical uh, aerial pictures that we have. I would love to. I have not, uh, but I would love to come see so them. So that would be great. And then, Jill, um, you know, when I met you, you were painting these gorgeous uh, apple trees. I remember just loving them. And then, of course, I've seen your paintings of animals, cows, horses, uh, and, of course, the wilderness. 
I wonder if you ever wanted to paint urban landscape. Mm. Mm -hmm. I did paint urban landscape oh, in graduate school. Yeah, I went to uh, Boston University for an MFA in painting. And I painted out the window. Sometimes I painted um, outside there. And I, I was not very inspired by the urban landscape. I do love um, looking at some painters like Rex Straw Downs, who paints large urban landscapes. Um, and I do love, love some paintings that other people done it just didn't seem like a good fit for me but it's still all about it doesn't the subject doesn't necessarily matter it's really about the shape of the color that you're painting not necessarily where you're painting question for both of you is there a season of the year that you prefer to work season oh spring when the, everything is just starting to mm -hmm. pop. I like that. Uh, I, I like all the seasons, but uh, there's something about winter and those blue shadows that's uh, pretty pretty exciting on those mornings when there's fresh snow and the, the shadows that are created are, are pretty um, colorful and can be abstract. But um, I, I've a, a learned to appreciate all kinds of weather with the drone. In the old days, I would be disappointed if it were cloudy, but now, you know, you can point it straight down and get some really amazing pictures of, of rivers and patterns on the land, and the lighting is very even. So, um, love the green of summer, but there's something about winter, too. It's really nice. I'm curious what the um, kind of role of a drone is in the water, and whether Back in France, and I was on the pilot watching the sunrise, and a drone like 20 feet away from me. Uh, good that's question. By far not a wilderness. Yeah. No, that's a very good question. Caleb, could you repeat the question? The question is what's the role of drones in wilderness areas? Uh, and that's a very good question because uh, there are lots of rules around drones, and that's one of the most important things to know. And um, I'm certified. So I have no excuse for not knowing them. But I know in national parks, you can't use them with Grand Canyon, some of the big uh, parks. Um, I think knowing um, the airspace that you're in is really important. So if you're around airports and things, that's, there are certain no-fly zones. Um, but in terms of the national forest, uh, I, I would need to check on that. But you have to certainly be very respectful of um, the space you're in. Um, so knowing the airspace is, is uh, very important. So, but most of the time when I'm out, I'm out. What's that? Uh, I'm I'm out, and I'm usually the only person out there. And rarely have I found any problems with that. You know, people, um, I think in Weybridge was the only place somebody had a problem with it. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it is. I think it, you, you are not allowed to fly a drone from the wilderness area. Um, here, where Caleb and I intersected a couple of times, um, Middlebury College Snowball, the part of Bailey's Falls that I, I that we were on um, is actually Middlebury College, and that is okay. Uh, Breadloaf proper, the Breadloaf Inn, can fly a drone there. Um, but I don't think you could go into like Silent Cliffs or into the wilderness area. Um, you could be adjacent to it. That's the regulation that I was told. Right. Yeah. Not sure. For instance, I'm working on an assignment in the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge, and drones are not allowed there. So, um, but you can fly up to the mountain and shoot in. So, yeah, it's really important to be respectful and know the rules. Yeah, and Caleb, you do shoot a lot in Weybridge. Do you ever see the eagles and the herons? Have, like, are you ever flying a kite up to those and seeing those in your drone vision? Not really. I'll see like barn swallows and things around farms. 
but I, I think they're they're much smarter than the drone and they stay away from it and vice versa. Mm. Um, I think maybe one time in Bristol there were some birds that were making a noise and I landed and, and stopped because it seemed like they were bothered. So yeah, I've never had any um, mid-air collisions and you know, try to, and it's relatively quiet. You know, there's a lot of other environmental noise that we're hearing right now. You know, snowmobiles and trucks and cars. The drone itself, it's a little quieter than the weed whacker, but it's it's still there's there's certainly people who might be bothered by them, but you have to be respectful. Several years ago, California Air Force Base was yeah, I love, I love her work. She said when she went on, she had to decide, is this going to be color or is this going to be color? Otherwise, is it going to be color? Is that a question that comes up for you or is it always going to be color? I mean, you want to have a white box or at least one of them. Are you ever tempted to say, let's go back to black and white? Right, so the question is color, black and white. Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I started at the Addison Independent developing black and white film, so I love black and white. But I think I just uh, see more in color, and um, I think rarely any of my photos would work in black and white. A lot of it's so much about the color. So even though I love black and white, I don't really shoot it that much. season, those colors will change. Um, so if it's, if it's going to be winter and there's going to be all those cool shadows that um, Caleb was talking about, I might put an orange, usually I'll put an orange because orange and blue are complements and it will make the blue shadows pop. So you want, you want that, um, I like to leave some of the underpainting showing through. This is pink because it's quinacridone red, actually. <laughs> and it, I'm, I'm going out to paint a specific area, and so this is the color I've chosen. Where would that area be? It's, it's over in Cornwall. I'm going from Weybridge to Cornwall. During <laughs> foliage. <laughs> 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 Bill, do you happen to have the painting with you that when we ran into yesterday that you were working on? I do not, but it's in my studio. Okay. It was very fun. I ran into Tracy yesterday, or she ran into me. I was painting up at Abbey Pond. Really beautiful. The mist had just lifted. Yeah, and I brought, so I had my like super light kit, right? I did not have my tripod. I did not have, yeah, I had those. Um, I did have this backpack, and I was sitting on this. Um, which you can sit on, so insulated, and uh, used to be Eben's sleeping pad, but I cut it up because I wanted some insulation. <laughs> I have to buy him a new one. Uh, it's in my studio, Tracy. You can come see it. We also have very similar backpacks, so that's. Must be, must be some kindred spirit. We get up at the same time, in the morning. <laughs> some more back things. So, Jill, I did not hear you mention that you do any photography so that you can take it back to the studio. Uh, talk about sketching, etc. So, is that something that you? Um, yeah, mostly I sketch. I find that going from a drawing to a painting just works better for me. I, I do take photographs, um, and sometimes I will look at them, but usually not to reference. Photographs flatten things. I, mean, I didn't study, I did 
studied one, I took one photography class maybe, um, but it seems to flatten everything. And so I'm looking for depth usually, or um, a little bit more depth, and I can do that preliminary sketch with a pencil or watercolor or gouache better, and it will have more relevance to my painting. Thank you for sharing your small. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for coming, and uh, we have a reception tomorrow night, five to seven, honoring uh, Jill and Caleb. And uh, all this is made possible uh, by memberships and by annual fund giving. And so I, I urge you, if you're not a member, to join. And also, uh, there are special donors who made this uh, exhibit possible, and they're listed on the exhibit wall. So I thank all of them, but I especially thank uh, you for coming today and uh, supporting uh, the museum, but especially uh, your fondness uh, for Jill and, and Caleb. So, and the gallery's open, and it'll be open till four o'clock, and we're open Tuesday through Friday, 10, 11 to 4, Saturday, 10 to 4. So let your friends know how wonderful this exhibit is. So thanks so much.